My absolute favourite headphone amplifier for the last couple of years has been the Zale HM1. I've been fortunate enough to be able to try all sorts of truly fantastic gear, but nothing has yet tempted me to switch away from it. In fact, the only headphone amplifier that I've tried that I felt was just as good as the HM1 was the Mascobo 465. And as well as being quite a lot more expensive, from a reviewer's perspective specifically, it does have some slight drawbacks like a higher output impedance that will then change the frequency response of many headphones and IEMs. But the problem with the HM1 is that beyond its fantastic sound quality, it has a bunch of extra features that not everyone needs or wants. Not everyone needs EQ, not everyone needs a preamplifier, not everyone needs input mixing. And so when it first came out, there were a lot of people that said, I really wish that I could just buy the headphone amplifier itself without all the extras and pay less for it. And I'm quite excited because today we're going to be talking about exactly that. This is the Zale H1. First, a little bit of background. Michael Zale is well known for producing some of the best mixing desks in the world, being used by artists like Nils Fromm, Aphex Twin, The Chemical Brothers, you can even find his stuff in the Rock and Pop Museum, and in fact all of the music that you'll hear in the background throughout this video is from artists using Zale gear. The HM1 has for a couple of years now, as said, been my personal favourite and benchmark reference for headphone amplifiers, and we'll talk a little bit about why when we get to the sound section, but for now, let's have a look at some of the differences between the HM1 and the new H1. The H1 uses the exact same amplifier design itself as its bigger brother, the HM1, a full Class A design that also has the option to run with zero negative feedback, the error correction mechanism that many amplifiers use or rely on to get their performance. Or you can turn the feedback correction on, giving you in some ways two different sounding amps in one box. The H1 forgoes the HM1's preamplifier circuit, so it's now a dedicated headphone amp only, and this also means no EQ and also a more traditional single input without any two input mixing. But it does still keep the left-right balance adjustment and luckily the stereo bass adjustment too which was one of my favourite features from the HM1, so I'm glad to see that that's stuck around. The H1 also adds a 4.4mm Pentacon output, which will be a nice addition for many IEM users. And as you'll be able to see from the full measurements of the H1, as well as measurements for the HM1, both of which are linked in the description available at the audio file section of headphones.com, though we will be talking about them a little bit in this video as well, the H1 behaves basically identically in every way to the HM1, except for the fact that for very, very low output levels, the noise floor is about 5 or so dB lower, which could also be a benefit for IEM users, especially in conjunction with the new minus 10 dB gain setting, which will give you more flexible volume control when outputting to extremely sensitive IEMs. From a build quality perspective, the main two differences seen here are that the unit itself is a little slimmer than the HM1, and the power supply transformer is now internal within the unit, encased in a mu metal shield, which does seem to work quite well given as the power supply noise is kept entirely under minus 150 dB. Otherwise, the construction is pretty much the same as the HM1, with a gorgeously finished front and end plate, a space grey coating on the main body and fins which has what I can best describe as a slight sparkle to it. The controls are knurled and have a really solid tactile feel to them, which is in part because Michael specifically chose the components here that, regardless of cost, he felt were best from a user's perspective. Though it's just logic switching, we use the Alma switches uh, Elma uh, rotating switches because they just feel right and that was important for us. There's a lot of other hidden aspects to this which really shows how much attention to detail has gone into the design at every single stage. Even small things like the fact that the volume control has a separate logic circuit so when you turn it down all the way it's not just attenuating via the potentiometer, when you hit the minimum a logic circuit clicks a relay and completely disconnects the input rather than just relying on the volume attenuation alone. Or that internally every single piece of the chassis from the end plate to the sides and the fins to the lid itself has an individual dedicated grounding connection because why not? The mains transformer has individual windings for not just the left and right channels, but also a third one just for the logic circuit and the LEDs on the front, just to keep those completely separate from any of the audio signal path stuff. The components for the amplifier are also binned, so it's not just a case of ordering a set of components and putting the amp together, they are tested and only the best performing ones actually go into a finished unit. If you want a bit of a peek inside and a walkthrough of the HM1, go and watch the video we filmed with Michael Zale at last year's Munich High End, linked in the description. But the summary is that this amplifier 
Spitfire is built beautifully and in a rather understated way. It doesn't have flashy aesthetics, and a lot of people will be thankful for that, but it doesn't really come across on camera how premium this looks and feels, and a lot of the hidden design aspects that show how much attention to detail went into every aspect of this product aren't even talked about in the marketing material. Before we dive into sound, I feel I might need to say that this is going to be an overwhelmingly positive review, and when a review is this positive, a lot of people might assume that there's some nefarious reason for that, that I got a unit for free, or I'm getting a kickback from sales or affiliate revenue or something. And so I just want to be crystal clear that the reason that this review is going to be so positive is because this amp is exceptionally good, and I'm very excited to talk about it. I paid for my personal HM1, this H1 unit is going back after the review, and whilst it is sold by headphones.com, we on the content team are kept completely separate from the business side of things and are in a unique position versus other reviewers to be able to say whatever we want about anything we choose to cover without needing to worry at all about how it could otherwise financially affect us. We have a video explaining how the headphone show works and it's important to be transparent about this stuff so I'd encourage you to go and watch that but we on the content team get paid a flat amount it does not matter if headphones.com sells one unit of something or a million units of something absolutely nothing changes for us personally. We have complete freedom to choose what we want to cover, be it products for a review or educational and topic-based content. Videos don't get approved or usually even seen by any of the headphones.com management before they go out, and there's been plenty of examples of us on the content team having quite negative things to say about products that headphones.com sells. In fact, Resolve's latest video was basically him dunking on the Moondrop Edge for 10 minutes. Okay. This is the Moondrop Edge, and it is terrible. All of this content and the ability for us to make honest reviews and not have to worry about are we going to make enough affiliate revenue to pay bills next month or is that manufacturer going to keep sending me stuff if I don't say nice things is made possible by headphones.com. So if you like what we do here and want to support it, consider choosing headphones.com for your next purchase, whatever that may be. They sell stuff that I don't like and if it turns out that you don't like something too, it doesn't matter because headphones.com has a 365 day return policy. So you can just send it back and their support staff who are also all audio files will help you out with anything you need. Anyway, with all of that out the way, why do I love the H1 so much? Well, to my ear, the H1 and the HM1 are the best possible examples of what a reference sound is. These are the amps that out of everything I have tried are genuinely most deserving of the description transparent. The H1 is a fully discrete class A design which is technically speaking the purest way to do signal amplification. Go and watch the video about how amp classes work if you're curious on that. But importantly the design has been done so well that even with no feedback correction at all this amp still performs great. Typically amps with no feedback, like a CFA3 or an Enlium Amp 23R, might get 60 to 80 dB of Synad, but the HM1 gets over 100, and then when you turn the feedback on, it gets about 114 dB. Even if you look at other Class A amps with feedback, most stuff is still not this good objectively. The Luxman P100 Centennial or the Headamp GSX Mark II both get about 105 dB, and the only Class A headphone amp that I'm aware of that does get this level of distortion performance is the Hollow Bliss, and that's a far less purist and higher feedback design, though it is also one of my favourite amps. The operating point for the transistors in this amplifier were first specified by theory, then by measurements on sample units, and then finally fine-tuned through listening tests with various mastering engineers. This is an amplifier that doesn't just rely on measurements alone or massive amounts of feedback to get a good Synad score and call it a day. It is at its core a fantastic Class A design that doesn't even need feedback to perform well, fine-tuned through a mix of objective and subjective input from people whose entire job is mastering music. And then it gives you the option for just enough feedback to push performance even higher, and the result is stunning, and why I bought an HM1 and it's been my benchmark since getting it. With feedback enabled or Class A plus servo mode, the H1 is immensely detailed. It doesn't matter what headphones I threw on it, it delivered a crystal clear, fast and natural sounding result. There are absolutely other amplifiers that will get you fairly close to the level of detail specifically that the H1 can provide, but the reason that I bought an HM1 rather than just saving the money and going for a much cheaper topping A90 or something is because whilst some of these amps can get the detail aspect right, they don't sound neutral or realistic to me. My experience has been that in particular with a lot of the op-amp based designs that rely on massive amounts of feedback for their performance, sometimes with op-amps nested in the feedback loops of other op-amps nested in the feedback loops of other op-amps, even if they get the detail aspect right, they just don't sound neutral, let alone natural to me. So even though the detail retrieval itself might be great, when the vocals come in, it just doesn't sound natural, it doesn't sound realistic, they sound thin or harsh or clinical compared to some 
something like the H1. One of the other drawbacks I often find is that there's a negative effect on soundstage as well. There's less depth to things, things are flatter, and so again, they just come across as more artificial overall. But the H1 stages massively. It feels completely unrestricted without any sort of inherent exaggeration for the stage like you might get from a tube amp, for example. For this reason, I found the H1 to be quite helpful when reviewing different decks, as it has allowed for some of the differences between them to become clearer and come through more, well, transparently than on other amplifiers. Bass is also an excellent aspect of the H1. Its leading edge is incredibly snappy and fast, but it also has the body and the visceral nature to back it up. It doesn't go into the trap of being either fast but thin or heavy but pillowy. Comparing the H1 to a Ferrum Ore, the H1 is fuller sounding, a little bit more natural overall, whilst still having slightly better detail, slightly better airiness in the upper treble, and still being able to do this with extremely demanding headphones. I use the Sesvara OG as one of my main headphones a lot of the time, and it's a quite difficult one to drive, but luckily the H1 handles high output current extremely well, each channel has a completely independent power supply, so large demands from one have no effect on the other, and it has hardly any rising distortion into higher output levels. Whereas quite a few other particularly Class A amplifiers do start to show rising distortion at even a fraction of their maximum. So on the H1, headphones like the Sesvara are driven and controlled exceptionally well. The best way that I can describe it is that the level of grip and control that the H1 has over the drivers, particularly for bassier electronic music, is honestly possibly the best I've heard. Which, considering Zale's stuff is used by artists like Aphex Twin and the Chemical Brothers, that's possibly not so much of a surprise. But a lot of the time there is to some degree a trade-off between how fast and punchy an amp can be and how well it can handle timbre and more legato, realistic elements of music. Two of my absolute favourite amps, the Hollow Bliss and the Ferrum Ore, are great examples of this. The Ore is a little snappier, it's more fun for electronic music, and a little bit more in your face with its detail than the Bliss, though not necessarily actually more detailed. But the Bliss is a little bit more natural sounding. It's better for jazz or vocal heavy music. Both of them are great all-rounders, and both really close to a genuine reference neutral compared to most of the high feedback op amp based designs, which, as said, I often find to lean too analytical and bright. Or some of the warmer stuff, like the Burson or Luxman, that do lose a little bit in terms of incisiveness or raw technical ability for the colour that they add. But even with both of these two being very close to what I'd call a genuine reference neutral, the H1 is right in the middle of these two, able to deliver stunningly realistic vocals, strings, orchestral renditions, and then turn around and hit you around the back of the skull for synthetic and electronic music, whilst still having a more open soundstage, better detail retrieval, and slightly clearer separation between elements than either of these two. And if you do want to add just a touch of flavour to the music, that's where the zero feedback mode comes in. By turning off the feedback, you get a little more second order harmonics. You get a slightly warmer, slightly richer presentation. It makes things sound just a little bit more lush compared to neutral, but it's not what I'd call a more laid back sound. In fact, the tactility and definition in the bass is still exceptionally good. It doesn't soften things up or loosen things up down there. But it adds just a slight sweetness to things in the mid range and treble that allows this amp to synergize with headphones like the Sennheiser HD800 or the Hyperman Sesvara Unveiled and take the edge off their inherent brightness without sacrificing detail. Having both of these options at your fingertips is really nice. It means that you can choose between a sound that is as close to a genuine transparent neutral as I've personally heard in a headphone amp, with some of the best technical ability I've heard in a headphone amp. Or you can choose a sound that still keeps almost all of that technical ability, but adds a little bit of tasteful warmth and colour to the sound. Now to be clear, the zero feedback mode does not turn the H1 into a chord alto or a tubey sound or something. It's not a drastic change, and that's good. I don't want a drastic change. If I want that much of a change, I'll put the headphones on a tube amp. But if the H1 was absolutely spot on neutral in Class A plus servo mode, with the OR being just a touch brighter, the Bliss being just a touch warmer, and then something like a Luxman being quite a bit warmer, going to zero feedback just kicks it to the other side of where the Bliss sits, for example. Having the ability to have just a little bit of tasteful added colour without sacrificing technical ability just puts a smile on my face. So what about the H1 versus the HM1? Well, they're using the same amplifier and both subjectively and objectively they are pretty much identical. With all the headphones I ran on these, I could not tell a difference between the two. They sounded identical to me. 
If you're running ultra-sensitive IEMs, like Campfire Andromedas or something, then maybe the 4 or 5 dB lower noise slot on the H1 might be a benefit to you, but for the IEMs that I did have here, again, I honestly could not tell a difference between these two. They sounded identical to me, which is good, because it means that if you don't need the extra features of the HM1, the H1 really is a streamlined HM1, the exact same sound, just without all the extra bits for less money. Now, I do love and use the features on the HM1 a lot. The EQ is very well done, and something that allows me to make quick adjustments to whatever headphone I might be wanting to listen to, and to do so in a way that is drastically more transparent than what most other analog EQ options available will give you. The change in distortion when maxing out the EQ on the HM1 is a couple dB, whereas on something like a shit Locius, it can be over 40 dB. I also review a lot of DACs, and so the ability to quickly switch between two different inputs, or to have one primary DAC streaming my music from Rune, and then my audio interface playing whatever my voice chat from Discord, or whatever's going on on my PC at the same time, into input B, and mix the two together is great for me, but if you're happy to use digital EQ, if you don't need input mixing, if you don't need a preamplifier, then the H1 does genuinely give you all of the performance of the HM1 in a slightly more compact form factor, and for less money. The one feature that for straightforward listening I would have missed and I'm very glad to see has been kept on the H1 is the stereo bass adjustment. I've said before, I am not a fan of crossfeed. It's a feature that you can find on a lot of different decks and amps, and it can be really useful for particularly older music, where elements are quite hard panned, the music was mixed exclusively for speakers with no consideration for headphones whatsoever, and they just don't really sound right on headphones. But particularly for a lot of well, most modern music, which does have some consideration for headphones. I find that it tends to just sort of push things in front of you and smear imaging quite a bit. It's not something that I personally enjoy for most music. But the stereo bass adjustment on the H1 and HM1 works differently. It has the effect of increasing the size of soundstage without changing the shape or direction of things. And for headphone listening in particular, I personally find it just outright superior for crossfeed and also something that is a benefit for 90% of music. I pretty much always keep that setting on plus one unless I am specifically listening to something that is either binaurally recorded or was clearly mixed almost exclusively with headphones in mind. So this feature alone is a big improvement to my personal listening enjoyment and I'm very glad to see that it made its way onto the H1. The H1 is not a cheap amplifier. It's over $6,000, but I've tried a lot of amps costing far more that don't sound as good as this. In fact, I mentioned in the beginning that the only other amplifier I like equally as much as the HM1 or H1 is the Mascobo 465, and that's over 15,000. The H1 is also not going to be limited to just 50 units per year globally like the HM1 is, so yes, it's expensive, but what you get for your money is truly incredible, and the H1 makes my favourite headphone amp a little more accessible. If you're looking for something that truly fits into the category of endgame amplifiers, and then gives you the ability to tune the sound to your liking, and improve the listening experience for headphones beyond what other amplifiers can do, the H1 is hands down my recommendation. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you've got any questions you wanted to ask about the H1, the HM1, or anything else relating to headphones, music, DAX, amps, gear, or anything at all, then come and say hey on the headphones.com Discord server, or the headphones.com forum, and I and other Wiggly Air enthusiasts will endeavour to help. Until next time, thanks for watching.